The Big Ten player at Northwestern, Western, some of you may remember Anthony during his collegiate years playing against Ohio State or other Big Ten opponents. As a redshirt freshman, he returned an interception for a touchdown in his first game to lead the upset of Penn State. He went on to earn all Big Ten and All-American honors several times during his career, then he was selected in the fifth round by the Indianapolis Colts and played four seasons before signing with the Cleveland Browns. Anthony hails from Opelika, Florida, which is near Miami, and two little known facts are that he was inducted, he was inducted into the membership of the National Honor Society in high school and also made it to the Junior Olympics in track and field in the 400 meter dash. Colts general manager Chris Fowler had high praise for Walker as he left the Indianapolis Colts. He described him as a team guy, a rare leader, and hopes that Anthony gets into coaching or scouting someday. Chris Ballard said, if Anthony Walker gets into coaching, he will be a head coach in the National Football League. And if he gets into scouting, he'll be a general manager. He's brilliant, he's absolutely brilliant, and he's made of the right stuff. Can we play the introduction video of Anthony Walker Jr.? Please don't hit us for music on this one. With the 158 pick in the 2017 NFL Draft, the Indianapolis Colts select <laughs> Anthony Walker Jr., linebacker, Northwestern. Bring up the team. Colts football is on the air. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the One America Radio Network at MetLife Stadium. I'm Matt Taylor, and we're getting ready for game action between the Colts and the Jets. Gang, gang, New York. You feel me? You all say I look good? Feel good? Play good? They tell you good? You lead good? Have a good life. So my daddy always told me. Watson is sending it to the defense, escapes, and they get a run from that play. And now they finally are able to get him, it is Anthony Walker. Everyone covered down the field, and Walker finally gets to him for the third set by Indianapolis. And the Browns were flying at the whistle. Make it again in the direction, this one was a bit. Yes, it was, Anthony Walker. Please join me in welcoming Anthony Walker to Walker. Mother and father that was able to do the same things for me 
and uh, put me in the best position, you know, not only athletically but academically, and being able to set myself up, you know, for success in the future. So uh, I just want to say thank you guys again for having me. Um, I'm happy to be a, a new face in you guys' community, and uh, in any way that I can help, I'm glad to do it. I appreciate it. We're going to take a few uh, questions from the floor, but we have a few prepared as Brian gets ready in a minute. We have four questions that uh, we'll ask Anthony to try to get started. Anthony, while you're known for your professional football skills, share with us about your track and field career and if you had any high aspirations in that sport. So my track and field career, um, I actually started off playing baseball first. I played for a year and I loved it. And my dad was like, all right, you love that sport too much, we're not playing. So, <laughs> uh, I was like, I don't want to play football, I don't want to play baseball. He was like, no, nah, we're not doing that. So, um, it's funny, me and my dad, we never really argued, but we argued about one thing, and that was track and field. He used to always tell me, you know, track is going to help you for football, create that mental toughness that you need on the football field. He was like, you can run it forward, you can do anything in life. And I'm like, no, I'm not trying to hear that. <laughs> so, I actually hated track. I hated running track. It was like the worst pain ever. I remember I quit twice before the Junior Olympics, like literally a day before the meet, like before we were supposed to leave, I quit. And my dad was like, okay, you quit, but go tell your coaches and your teammates that you quit. Went to practice and yeah, never quit. <laughs> um, but for me, like I said, I, I feel like that's been the most success, you know, the most important part of my success um, outside of, you know, my, my, my village. Uh, me running track. Um, I never had high aspirations for it. I just did it because my dad forced me to do it. And uh, that's the story on that. <laughs> that's a great lesson we have. And let's transition to the next question because we've heard and know that you have a special relationship with your father, who was once your coach. And you said, I'm blessed to have my dad as a coach. Uh, we kept a coach player in the field, but off the field, it was back to dad again. Tell us about that relationship and how that's impacted you for your success. Yeah, so um, my dad uh, has been pretty much the rock for me. Um, my mom and dad were never really together, and uh, I moved with my dad when I was a year old, a year old, and it was literally me and my dad in the house until I left for college. Um, very special relationship that I have with him. Um, I know for a fact I would not be here today if I didn't have that father in my life. Um, Nope. I mean, I tell everybody, I don't know how he did it, because I know I was a head case. But uh, uh, just all the lessons that he taught me, um, the sacrifices that he made, um, you know, growing up. I didn't even, I couldn't tell you that we were poor, but, you know, looking back at it, we were very poor. But he never made me feel like that. And, um, you know, I just, like I said, the sacrifices that he made, um, not, more so not even football-wise, um, you know, never told me, oh, we're, we're trying to make it to the NFL. But more so, just being a good person, being a good human being, and uh, that's going to take you further in life. And um, you know, obviously, excelling in the classroom, uh, on top of being a football coach, my dad is dean of students at my high school. So yeah, wow. I never got in trouble. <laughs> I was not trying to go to his office. So um, yeah, very special relationship with him. I still talk to him every day. Um, I told him when I was leaving for college, uh, I was going to call him every day. He's like, no, you're not. Like, you want some kids go to college? They're not going to talk to their parents. And I literally call him every day, and I still call him, you know, three, four times now to, you know, just check in back at home and get on his nerves a little bit. So, uh, yeah, great relationship with my father. Thank you. Two more quick questions. As Chris Fowler, GM of the Indianapolis Colts, projected, he feels you'd be an excellent coach once your career is over. Any chance we would see you in NFL coaching someday? I actually do want to get into coaching. Um, I don't think it would be the NFL level. I would probably want to go to high school where the politics and the business side of it doesn't really get in the way. You're still able to coach the passion and the love for the game. Um, I know you guys can see the NFL stories every day about something new with player and coach and all that. And it kind of takes the fun out of the game sometimes. So, um, like I said, the high school level is kind of where I want to be at. My dad is a high school coach. And now, 
And the last question we have is, being from Miami, Florida, was it a dream of yours to play for the U? And if it did, we know that dream to be a hurricane never happened, but now you're an NFL star. What message about that experience or about that dream can you share with the audience tonight? Yeah, so growing up from Miami, everybody wants to go to the U. Uh, that was my number one school. Um, I was die hard. I went to every game. Um, by my dad being a high school football coach, we went to every game from the age I was six to my junior year of high school. And then my senior year, I got to not go. <laughs> yeah, I took my own stand. But um, I never got an offer from them. Um, it, I think I was upset at the beginning, but like I said, my dad kind of really instilled academics into me, so it was like, if I don't go to Miami, I want to go to Stanford or Duke, and I think those are two are the two that hurt the most that I didn't get a chance to get an offer from. And then I didn't even know about the Western, literally, like somebody told me one day, hey, you know, the Western is a pretty good academic school, too. So I'm like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so we have a good football team in Miami high school called Miami Northwestern, so I thought they were playing a joke on me, like literally. And um, the coach came in, and, watched my tape and gave me an offer right away and I ended up committing not too long after that. Um, I feel like that's the best decision I ever made, uh, leaving home, having to be on my own, having to grow up you know, really fast. Um, I met some great people at Northwestern, uh, some of my best friends. I actually just went to a wedding with my freshman year roommate. I was his best man. And uh, you know, just, just the awesome community that we had there, um, being able to play Big Ten football and also get a great uh, degree. Uh, it made up for not being able to go to Miami, um, but yeah, it's still there. I did want to throw it to you. So. <laughs> All right, thank you. As we move into questions, I'm going to turn it over to the founder of the event, Mr. Brian Hall, who will take questions from the floor. All right, here's our first one. Thank you for coming. Question for you, because this is a little bit different. Last year, you went Coming from Indianapolis, you came to Cleveland, and you decided to pick a single-digit number versus what linebackers usually had. Was there a reason behind that? And just wondering why you chose a single digit, and just wanting your opinion on that. Yeah, so I grew up, obviously, like I said, Miami football, um, which, you know, sorry guys, but that's the mecca of football. <laughs> <laughs> I love Ohio football too, but that's the mecca of football, so. Um, it was tradition that, you know, you were, you know, the top nine players on the team, you all got a single digit number. Um, at my high school, they even made it like, it was super, it was a prestigious, you know, honor to have that. And um, even in college, I wore number one my senior year. Um, so I kind of wanted to go back to that when the, when the NFL made that change. Um, and I went to number four first because that was my first jersey number that I had when I played football. And um, yeah, that was the reason for that. I got two, uh, two, you know, very close friends on 
team, Jacoby Brissett, the new quarterback, um, and also John Johnson. Uh, we kind of built that relationship with those guys since I've been in the NFL. Um, yeah, but we have a lot of great guys. I love them. I love our team. Hey, how you doing? Now, you're a Big Ten guy, so tell me about a Buckeye memory. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so we, uh, I'll tell you this one. We were playing, well, I have two actually. The Saturday night game when we played them in 2013. Yeah, 13. I was a freshman. I didn't play. I registered, but that was a great environment to be in. We played at home, and that was the first time college game day had been there. So it was really dope um, to see, you know, how the city came out for that. And uh, the second one would probably be one of my worst memories ever of football. Um, we're playing Ohio State uh, at the shoe my senior year, and it's 24 20. If we get a stop, I swear we win this game. It's 30 and 20. And JT Barrett runs a quarterback draw for 25 yards only because the receiver stepped on the corner's ankle and broke it on that play. Yeah. <laughs> and he ran for 20 yards. That was like really devastating to me. So, yeah. Welcome to Cleveland. <laughs> Good air for those. I guess they're not here tonight. Okay. Every kid dreams about being a professional something. And I don't know if that would have been, you know, it sounded like uh, baseball was your dream. Where were you and when was it that you actually came to know that you were going to be in the NFL? That's a great question. Um, so I never really. I never really dreamed about playing professionally anything because, like like you guys in this community here, um, I had guys that I looked up to, and I looked up to when I was younger. I looked up to the high school players. So I just wanted to get to high school and play at the biggest high school. And then when I got to high school. Those guys went to the University of Miami, so I wanted to go to the University of Miami and be like those guys. When I got to college, those guys got to the NFL, and I was like, oh, now I want to go to the NFL. And then the moment when I realized. You guys set me up for this one. When I caught the uh, interception against Penn State my freshman year. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I can play this well. <laughs> Hi, so you mentioned that you were uh, in track when you were younger. So I was wondering how that environment, like with your coaches and your teammates, like different from the football environment. Yeah, I think um, my dad used to always tell me, you know, track is an individual sport with team events, and football is a team first event. You know? So, um, in practice, it was like you got to worry about yourself. You know? When you're in track, you worry about yourself when you're running individual races, and you got to train like that. But in football, it's like how can I help the team, or we got to do this together as a team more so than anything. So, just the team to individual aspect of it. Hey, I have one. So, being a Browns fan, um, this speaker I think gets in the way. Um, I heard you say a couple times tonight that we're ready in Cleveland. Why? Why? What's the difference? What What, what do we have to look forward to? Yeah, I think um, you know you you put the the, the time in. You know, I swear. 
where I felt the, the earth shaking. <laughs> so uh, those two are probably the loudest things that I've ever played. Welcome to the people. We're glad to have you. So it's been a long off season for really a lot of reasons, but is the team behind you, Kobe? Yeah, no doubt. No um, doubt. If I had anything to say about it, um, I've, I've known Kobe seven years now uh, from very similar backgrounds back at home. He went, he's from West Palm Beach. I'm from Miami, which isn't too far. Um, we were in India, Indianapolis together. Um, knowing the person that he is, um, He's not, a, he's not going to wow you, he's not a raw, raw person, but he's always going to do his job, and that's all you can ask for. And, you know, you want a guy that can, you know, be that be that guy for you. You know, he's, he's a consistent guy, he shows up every day, he's prepared, he's ready to go. Um, I have no doubt that we'll, be, we'll all be behind him. How you doing? Welcome to Cleveland. So I know 10 months ago you had a hamstring injury. I was wondering if you were uh, completely recovered from that. And then I read that you were like the best at breaking down the film. Are you still teaching these rookies what's up at, at the linebacker spot? Uh, injury part, I can't speak on. That's uh, in-house with the Browns, so that's part of the contract. But um, yeah, I, I enjoy breaking down film. That's kudos to my dad and you know the other coaches that I had when I was in high school and college. Um, and I do try to spread that wisdom, you know, and that knowledge to, you know, my, the rookies or any teammate that asked me for it. Um, it was something that I kind of established when I was in Indy when I would break down for them was to have the linebackers come over and uh, just kind of translate it when I got here as well. Hey, I'm a huge fan. I got a question uh, because you played with Darius Leonard with the Colts, and he was super talented. It was really quite a, an amazing duo there in Indianapolis. How would you compare JOK to that type of town on the weak side as you play that mic? Yeah, um, I think JOK is a very unique talent. I think Darius, um, you know, you talk about the, the freakish athlete uh, as far as like size and build and stuff like that. Super tall, super strong, super big hands. Um, that helps him you know, create turnovers and be in passing lanes and be able to get ball carries down and very fast and athletic. Um, but they talk about Zell K and I think he may be, you know, one of the quickest guys on our team, including the DBs and receivers and stuff like that. Um, you know, I think he I tell him all the time he played defensive back when he was in college and now they're trying to make him a linebacker. But um, obviously his tool set goes with the will linebacker position. Um, you know, like I told him the Darius best year was from year one to year two. And a lot of people don't know that because his stats went down, but his level of play of intelligence went up, and he was able to make plays without even using all his athletic ability, which I think is the, you know, take the next step in the NFL. And I think JOK is going to do the same thing this year. I won't bust you too much. <laughs> it's interesting you said that you didn't know you were going to go to the league and you play Penn State, so. This is in the top of many lines. But anyway, um, <laughs> what other positions did you play prior to playing linebacker? And did you, or did you always play linebacker, or did you know when was the transition to linebacker? Yeah, so um, I actually played quarterback growing up, uh, quarterback and defensive back. And then when I got to high school, I played receiver slash safety. And then in some games, I'll go down and play linebacker. Um, but we were not the heavy run team. Um, and I actually got, I did all my, when I did all my uh, camps to go, to go to college camps and, you know, try to get recognized and stuff like that, I just went to linebacker one day and that was when I got my first offer. I was like, all right, I guess I'm staying here. <laughs> but it's funny because, like, I always, you know, play quarterback and it's only one guy that always told me and my dad, like, he's going to be a linebacker. Like, he always said it, like, he's going to be a linebacker. Like, I had no idea what he was talking about, linebacker was a foreign language to me. And uh, it worked out. Two-part question: How you went to went to Northwestern? You went to Northwestern.
workout practices? How does that transition to the other part? The other part is, what do you think about the NIL? With all the new recruits. <laughs> <laughs> That's loaded. High school players as well as current D1 athletes. Um, so college workouts are kind of preset. Um, and they're the hardest thing I've, outside of track. College workouts are the hardest thing I've ever done as far as uh, mat drills in the winter. I um, hated it. Uh, but, um, but I think that was the most team building, you know, team bonding that we were able to get done um, at, at that aspect. Um, NFL workouts, you, you spend most of the time, you know, outside of season or training camp, you spend most of the time at home, not away from the facility with no kind of set schedule, set workouts. So you gotta kind of create that schedule or you know work at the, on your own almost. And um, you know you see a lot of guys that aren't able to set that or they don't come from you know discipline or anything like that. And they're like they're not able to train properly to get ready for training camp because you know it's hard. You, know, you don't understand that you're you got from the season in possibly January or February till August to get ready for training camp and. You know, you got all that free time to do kind of whatever you want. You know, so just creating that those habits, good habits and good discipline to go get up and work out every day and you know, just to prepare yourself for, you know, a 17 game season. Uh, and NIL. Ooh. I don't know how you guys do that. <laughs> I think NIL is great, um, obviously for the players and the families and stuff like that. I think if I'm being honest, I knew I Somebody asked me about this when before it even came out. I said it's going to create a very slippery slope, and that NCAA need to get out in front of it and take care of it. But they did it, and now they're feeling the effects of it more so than the players are. Um, so, like I said, it's a slippery slope, and somebody needs to take charge of it before we're, you know, living in very weird times where players are going to get coaches fired right away. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you so much. If you guys could do me a favor um, and stay in your seats as much as possible, um, we're going to start the live auction and people are trying to bid and if you're walking around, it's hard, it won't take long. Anthony's gonna stay up here anyway and help us with the items. And then afterwards, he's going to talk to you guys. So um, we can get started right away with our auctioneer. Uh, Mark Walton. Thank you, Anthony.